How did the planets get their names? Well, that's a story that goes back to the very cradle of civilization. One of the oldest surviving stories of creation is the ancient Mesopotamian Enuma Elish. In this story, the universe begins with two primordial beings, Tiamat, who is chaos and the saltwater oceans, and Absu, who is the freshwater rivers and streams. Tiamat and Absu become partners, and the gods descend from them. But the new gods are wicked in their ways in the eyes of Tiamat and Absu. Tiamat wants to spare the new gods, but Absu decides to do away with them and start over. But the other gods are forewarned. They use a potion to put Absu to sleep, and then they kill him. Tiamat is enraged at the loss of Absu. She creates a gigantic army of monsters and rampages across the cosmos. No one can stand against her, until one of the youngest gods comes forward, Marduk, the god of storms. Marduk agrees to fight against Tiamat and her army, but only if the other gods agree to lend him some of their power, and only if Marduk is made king upon his victory. The other gods agree and give Marduk weapons and power, including the power of the wind. It's a fierce battle, but eventually Marduk uses the winds to trap Tiamat and slay her. Marduk uses Tiamat's body to create the sky and to make it firm. And across the sky, he makes shrines and likenesses of the other gods to honor them. And he stations 300 gods in the sky to protect it. Then he uses the blood of the most powerful monster of Tiamat's army to create humankind in order to serve the gods and to help protect the natural order. Of the gods who live in the sky, seven are particularly important. Unlike everything else in the sky, these would move across the sky from night to night. Utu is the god of the sun. He is all-seeing and represents truth and justice. Nana, the Lord of Wisdom, is God of the Moon. Nabu, the God of Writing and of Scribes, would later come to be known as Mercury, the Messenger. Inanna, or Ishtar, the Goddess of Love and War, who would come to be known as Venus, the Goddess of Love. Ira, or Nurgle, the God of Destruction and the Conqueror of the Underworld, would become Mars, the God of War. Marduk, the god of storms and the king of gods would become Jupiter. And Ninurta, a patron god of farmers, would become Saturn, a god of agriculture and renewal. The most well-known versions of these stories of the planets and the constellations are those of the classical Greeks. It's actually from ancient Greek that we get the word planet, which literally means wanderer for those special objects that appear to wander across the sky. The Greek gods have countless adventures and misadventures, but their story begins with the earth and the sky, personified by Gaia and by Uranus. This couple begets the Titans, one of whom, Cronus, overthrows his father and takes dominion over the cosmos. Kronos rules wisely, and for time untold, he oversaw a golden age without war or famine or even a need for laws. But eventually, Kronos heard from his deposed parents that they'd prophesied that just as Kronos had overthrown his father, eventually Kronos would be overthrown by one of his own children. In order to prevent this, Kronos would devour each of his children when they were brought to him. But Cronus's wife, Rhea, was not happy with this arrangement. Eventually, Rhea gave birth to a son named Zeus. But instead of presenting Zeus to Cronus, Rhea disguised a stone as the baby and handed it to Cronus instead. Without even looking, Cronus swallowed the stone whole. Rhea then hid baby Zeus away and let Zeus be raised by a goat named Amalthea. When Zeus was of age, he freed his five siblings from his father's stomach, and the six of them waged war against Kronos, and eventually won. This cycle was to repeat itself. It was also prophesied that Zeus would be one day overthrown by one of his own children, but that's a story that has yet to be told. Most of the planets as we now know them are named for gods of Roman mythology, who are usually quite similar to their earlier Greek counterparts. 
Zeus is the precursor to Jupiter, as Kronos is the precursor to Saturn. Hermes and Ares are children of Zeus, and they are represented in Roman mythology and in the sky as Mercury and as Mars. Aphrodite was Romanized into Venus, and she was created when a part of Uranus fell into the sea when he battled Kronos. Poseidon and Hades are the classical Greek gods of the ocean and of the underworld, and they're Zeus's brothers, and they were Romanized into Neptune and Pluto. Uranus is the only one of the modern planets to be named directly after a figure of the Greek rather than Roman stories. The Roman analog for Uranus is Calus. And remember Malthea, the goat who raised baby Zeus? She is in the sky too, twice actually. She is traditionally represented by the star Capella, the sixth brightest star in the night sky. And one of Jupiter's moons is also named for Malthea. Incidentally, the seven classical planets, the seven objects that move across the sky, our modern days of the week were created in their honor by the Babylonians. And even through many changes in how our calendars are organized, the seven-day week persisted. Our current days are by way of the newer Norse stories. Sunday was named for the sun and Monday for the moon. Tuesday is named for Tyr, who displaced Mars. Wednesday is in honor of Odin, who replaced Mercury. Thursday is for Thor, who is like Jupiter and Marduk, a god of storms. Friday is for Freya, who took over for Venus. And Saturday is, you guessed it, for Neptune. No, just kidding, it's named for Saturn. Even after thousands of years, our calendars bear the marks of stargazers of ancient civilizations. Next Thursday, spare a thought for a stargazer 3,000 years ago, looking up and seeing Marduk, the vanquisher of Tiamat and the god of storms, whose legacy lives on in our traditions even to this day. <laughs>